So this three pound semi-gelatinous mass, <laughs> which we call the brain, is where you live in your body. And the reason you live there is because it has 100 billion brain cells, each of which has thousands of connections. So you pretty much have trillions of brain states that constitute you. It is also the brain that allows you to contemplate on the most fundamental questions facing mankind, which are, who are we? Where did we come from? And where are we going? It also allows you to ponder on the expanse of the universe. It even is able to think about its own attributes, like consciousness, memory, human abilities, like leadership, mathematical abilities, musical abilities. Now, consciousness has been in the realm of philosophy and religion and spirituality. But it is an essential attribute of the human brain. You have three states of consciousness. Awake, when you're sleeping, and dreaming. So awake, sleep, and dream. Now, I cannot really tell you why you go to sleep. We don't know that. We do know that if you keep animals awake beyond a certain point, they die. We don't know why they die, but they do. So there's a lot for us to learn about sleep. But we know almost nothing about dreams from a neuroscience perspective. We have a few theories, but we really don't. Each one of you here had four vivid dreams last night. And so by a show of hands, how many remember all four of your dreams? OK, so maybe one. <laughs> right. And there is a reason why you do not remember your dreams. Because the phase of sleep in which you're dreaming it's called REM, rapid eye movement sleep. Your eyes are literally jiggling during that phase of sleep. And once that jerky eye movements go away, you are programmed to forget your dreams. So you only remember the dreams where you wake up during a REM phase or around a REM phase. The other interesting fact is each one of you was completely paralyzed during the four dreams you had last night. If I was to put a needle in your muscles, it would be a flat line. That's how paralyzed you were. Right? And then you'd recover from that paralysis. Now, there's another phenomenon in which we find these jerky eye movements of some interest. When we have patients who have right brain damage and they're paralyzed on their left side, some of them deny their weakness. So they'll say, I'm not paralyzed. I can clap with one hand. They claim to hear themselves clapping with one hand. And when we don't understand something in neuroscience, what do we do? We give it a long Latin sounding name. <laughs> and so the name for this phenomenon is enosognosia. Why do we do that? Because when we tell our patients and their families that, they develop a sense of confidence that we know what we're talking about. <laughs> But in these patients who've developed a noshognosia, they're denying their weakness, they're clapping with one hand. If you can induce jerky eye movements, and how do you do that? You squirt ice cold water into their ear canals and they get these jerky eye movements. Don't ask me why we did that. <laughs> but when you do that, till the time they have these jerky eye movements, they are conscious of their weakness. The moment the jerky eye movements go away, they start denying their weakness. So jerky eye movements are able to take you into a different plane of human consciousness. And as soon as the jerky eye movements go away, you come right out of that plane of human consciousness. It's fascinating and it's mysterious. It's also the subject of my research. But more fundamentally, what is consciousness from a brain perspective? So if you see these this blue circuit 
that's on the slide right now. There are neuronal circuits that go from the depth of your brain to the surface and then come back to the depth. It's like any electrical circuit. If this neuronal circuit oscillates at a frequency of three hertz, three cycles per second, you're unconscious. If it oscillates at a frequency of eight hertz, you're conscious. So this is the fundamental basis of human consciousness from a brain perspective. There are lots of influences. There are ascending systems that come out of the brain stem. There are other systems that influence this basic circuit. But this is what determines your state of consciousness. And in animals, neuroscientists have been able to change the oscillating frequency. So they switch it to a low frequency, animals unconscious. They switch it to a high frequency, the animal's conscious. And very recently, we've put in deep brain stimulators into the deep part of your brain there, in the thalamus. These are specialized wires that go in. You switch that on in patients with coma, in comatose patients who are unconscious, and we have found that they actually wake up. So for the first time in human history, we are able to modulate human consciousness in a way we have never been able to do before. And think of the ramifications. All of those people who are unconscious, lying in intensive care units, if we could wake them up, how different the world would be today. And this is just the beginning of our journey into human consciousness. Now the second concept, human ability, an attribute of the brain. As a physician, as a neurologist, what was my purpose in life? It was to bring the subnormal to normal, right? You became weak, we treated you, you became whole again and you could move just normally. You had a fever, we treated you, and you had normal body temperature. The entire basis of medical science was to take subnormal to normal. But in the last few years, there is this fascinating new area where you take normal to supernormal. Normal abilities in mathematics, music, reading, memory to supernormal. And this area is called neural enhancement, or as I like to call it, manufacturing geniuses. <laughs> right? So if we have to study the science of geniuses, we have to first study geniuses or savants as they exist in their brains. And so some of you may recognize this gentleman, the late Kim Peek. Right? He was a, a savant, he was a genius. He had read between nine to 12,000 books and he remembered almost every line of every page of every book he had ever read. There is nothing in his brain that would explain that. Right? And there are many savants like him. So an elegant theory was propounded. We do this in neuroscience, right? If I, pro if I propose a theory, you cannot disprove it. It will eventually appear in a textbook with my name on it. <laughs> and so the theory was that your brain develops by brain cells migrating outwards. And the theory was that more brain cells migrate to a particular region of your brain, you develop special abilities there, and that's how savants and geniuses are created, right? And that even appeared in textbooks, till we found people who were not born with special abilities, right? But they suffered some sort of damage to the brain, and this unleashed their special abilities, supernormal abilities. So there is a type of dementia, you know, Alzheimer's is one type of dementia where you have memory problems. Another type of dementia is frontotemporal dementia, where the front inside of your brain degenerates. Right? And some of, so these individuals now cannot recognize family members, cannot balance their checkbooks, they're having difficulties in all cognitive domains. Right? But as they are getting demented, some of them develop into great painters. They paint beautiful landscapes, something they've never been able to do before. I know of an individual who was a D student in art all his life, as he developed this sort of dementia, he was painting beautiful landscapes and portraits, right? 
some damage, degeneration to the brain, unleashing an ability like this. Now we know that we have people who've had a bleed in their brain or around their brain, people who've had a head injury, and they've developed supernormal genius-like artistic abilities, memory abilities, mathematical abilities. So let us take a step back and understand this. What is this telling us? This is telling us that there are genius-like abilities that exist in every human brain on this planet today. And we could potentially unravel those genius-like abilities. So, very recently, they've used this piece of equipment. This is a transcranial magnetic stimulator. Essentially, it's a wand that can stimulate or inhibit any region of your brain. It can activate or shut down regions of your brain, right? And so what did they do? Inspired by the frontotemporal dementia patients who turned into artists, they shut down the most affected area of your brain in frontotemporal dementia in normal volunteers by this one to see if they develop enhanced artistic abilities for a period of time. And a certain number of these individuals have developed enhanced artistic abilities by this experiment. So where are we today? We're standing at the threshold of an era where you can enhance human abilities or unleash or unravel the genius of every human brain on this planet today. An ability we never had before. Let me introduce this third concept, memory. Memory is what stores everything you remember about your life, everything in your past. Now, where does memory exist in your brain? Well, it was an unfortunate incident, and that's how we learned about where memory stays in your brain. There was a patient, HM, and HM had uncontrollable seizures, and the treatment for seizures is medications, but if medications fail, you do surgery. You find out where the seizures are coming from in the brain, and you cut that region out. So his doctors, HM's doctors, weren't sure where his seizures were coming from. Were they coming from this red area of hippocampus on one side, or were they coming from the red area hippocampus on the other side? And they said, what's the problem? Let's just cut both sides out, right? <laughs> Which they did. And the surgery was a success because his seizures were well controlled. But there was a minor problem. And the problem was that HM could never form new memories from there on. And he even lost memory for a few years prior to his surgery. So every time you would meet HM, you would have to reintroduce yourself. So when someone met him today, they would introduce themselves. If you came back a month later, you would have to introduce yourself again, just as if it was the first time you were meeting him. Through HM, we learned that memories are formed in the hippocampi of your brain, and we try not to repeat that mistake again in neuroscience. So at the macro level, where, what happens to memory in your brain? So if someone tells you a phone number that you have to dial now, right, you keep that in the front of your brain for the first few seconds or minutes. Then that memory is transported to the hippocampi, the red regions there. And that's where it gets converted into long-term memory, and that's where it stays for a few years. And then finally, it is moved out to the rest of your cortex of your brain. Where does it go? If they were visual memories, they go to the vision area of your brain in the back. If they were auditory memories, they go to the hearing part of your brain on the side. That's where your memories stay. So we know at a macro level where the memories are in your brain. But that's not enough. We need to know at the micro level. So by the work of Eric Kendall and other neuroscientists, we have now found all the cellular and molecular processes that give rise to memory. What have we learned from their work? That memories, the basis of memory is connection between two brain cells. So this connection between two brain cells is called a synapse. In short-term memory, the synapse becomes stronger. 
in long-term memory, and how do you form long-term memory? If you practice a task multiple times, you form long-term memories. Practicing a task multiple times causes a genetic change in brain cells that leads to formation of a new connection, and that's long-term memory. Now, what is the significance of knowing all this? Well, the significance is that because we've learned about the cellular and molecular processes of memory, we today have com chemicals and drugs that can strengthen your memory and that can wipe away your memory. Think about this. Memories are what make you who you are. The second picture that I have with the rat in a tank of water, this was an interesting experiment. So if you put, if you take a tank full of water and have a submerged platform, right? And you put a rat in, the rat swims around and finally finds that submerged platform and stands on it, right? And then, the second time it'll go around and find it quick, much quicker than the first time, the third time it goes around, and so memory is being formed. However, the first time the rat goes around and finds the submerged platform, if you inject adrenaline, it'll burn that memory in the rat's brain. The next, the next time you let the rat, it goes straight to the submerged platform. Based on this, when is adrenaline pumping in your, in your body? When you're in a traumatic situation, right? Like war. And therefore, those memories cause flashbacks and you get PTSD. More recently, they've given them adrenaline-blocking drugs. So people who've suffered trauma, major trauma, they give half of them adrenaline-blocking drugs, the other half, no such drug. And because the adrenaline-blocking drugs are preventing that burning of the memory in the brain, these people that got adrenaline-blocking drugs, and these are beta blockers, your anti-hypertension medications that a lot of people take, if you give them that for a period of time, they have much less incidence of PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder than people otherwise. So where are we today? We are standing at the threshold of a new era in human existence where we can modulate human consciousness, enhance human abilities, and even modify human memories. Thank you. <laughs>